everything to start. Franco, we may be just a few minutes behind because another meeting is letting out. So, That's fine. So we're just one. You guys hear me okay? Yes. Uh, Sprocket, is uh, Franco's voice good? Okay. Okay, everything's good. So, gentle, welcome, gentle. Oh, thank you, Shiloh. That's very kind of you. I appreciate that. Send out notices to all the groups that I could. Um, that's Friday was one of them. But I know you have other groups too. But he's been so helpful. Trey. Hi, Trey. Raise my plan B in case my power goes out. We had storms last night. There's five. <clears throat> we are waiting for just a few more minutes. Oh, thank you, Shiloh. That's very kind of you. I hear a bird, Frank, though. Is that you? Oh, yes. That's my cell phone. I mean, <laughs> you set off my birds. <laughs> birds. <laughs> Turn off the ringers. <laughs> Turn off the birds. <laughs> I have to hide my house. Birds box. off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this to all the groups that I could. Um, birds. Yeah. Uh, we turned off our birds here on this land because they were interfering with the um, with the live feed. <clears throat> well, that's not that's not mine. It's not that right, the creek up there. Yeah, but I know you have we other groups too. We, we turned those off. Um, for everybody who's so already helpful. here, there's a big blue box over here that you can click on to get a new card and la and um, um, links that will take you to a video and take you to the live feed if you want to watch that. Get started in a few minutes. You know, I've been trying to use the avatar in the stand, but forget it. I have to eat from here. And whatever's comfortable for you, that's fine. I'm going to uh, just say my opening remarks and then move to the back so I can change your slides. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you want to sit in that chair, I reserve that green and white chair for you. Oh, this one for me? Okay. Put on it. <laughs> there you go. Hey, there you go. I like to see it. Excellent. David says he can hear us speak. Uh, he sent me a, a clip of the of the video that's live streaming. Mm -hmm. Where start? is that link if I want to pass it? Say that again, Franco. Where is that link for live streaming? Is the one you sent before? Um, yeah, but you can get it out of this box right here where I'm standing. The blue box. Do you see it? Click on the blue oh, I see. box. Okay. Yeah. Um, David said he can hear us, Sprocket. So live feed is going well. 
we have just a few more minutes. Hopefully more people will arrive. Thank you, Shay. You are always so helpful. Really appreciate it. Keep tossing that popcorn, girl. But we do have coffee and ice cream if you'd like it. It's over there on the uh, little carts. It's fun. Mm. Give it just a couple more minutes. Hmm. Let me know how it tastes, Fiona. I haven't had any yet. Welcome day. Glad to see you here. Give it one more minute. One more minute. See if we get some more visitors. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shay. Oh, who's got my feedback? Was that you, Franco? I'm sorry? You have the Mom. live... Hello, Lauren. Welcome. There are seats up front for you. Thank you. Uh, hi, Lauren. There's a small chair up here for you if you'd like. You can sit beside Shay. Where I'm standing over here in the front by the screen. Okay, I think we should get started. As guests arrive, we will just let them have a seat. I'm going to be speaking in voice and I have for my introduction I have a speakeasy that will also go into local chat if you want to follow along with that. On behalf of the senior scientist David Fries of the Bayou Tahar Digital Twin Project, we welcome you to Bayou Tahar in the virtual platform of Second Life. <clears throat> We thank the participants in and out of Second Life for your attendance 
to this new Frontiers in Science, Art and Design virtual seminar, seminar series. We'll be hosting um, these events uh, monthly uh, at this location, which will be live streamed on YouTube. These talks will also be archived for later viewing. So for anyone who didn't hear me, you can click on the blue box behind me and it'll give you all of the, um, the links. At this time, we'd like to acknowledge and thank Spiff Whitfield, who will be live streaming this event on his YouTube channel. We're very appreciative of his help and generosity of his time. We'd also like to thank a few people without whom this project could not have been created. First, Max Silver Umaroff, who applied his building and landscaping talents to create this land and the buildings. we also like to thank Traco Darlins, uh, who installed her Second Life Newcomer tutorials and new avatars in our welcome center, along with the immersive art installation on the second floor of the Senior Center for the Arts. So I hope you all get to see those things before you leave. This project was powered by our community and we thank them all so very much. Bio Tuhar is a citizen science project supported by Pensacola, Perdido, Bayes Estuary Program and in development at the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, which is a nonprofit research center affiliated with the State of Florida University System. The Bayou Tahar program supports teaming scientists and sensing machines on waterfronts and using phones for reporting data to help form connections between citizens and the Bayou Tahar and Pensacola Bay watershed located in Pensacola, Florida. The goal of this seminar talks is to draw creative connections between ideas in science, art and design, and the natural setting of the bay and the bayou. Since the Second Life Bayou Tahar project is a mimicry of the real location, it's fitting that our first speaker will be talking about mimicry of design in nature and how it is used to create iconic products used by people around the world. Our speaker today is Mr. Franco Lodato. Mr. Lodato is an accomplished and inventive creative leader who designs meaningful and dynamic products that improve the lives of others, of users, sorry. He works confidently across materials research, personal and healthcare, lifestyles and luxury, education, consumer electronics, and wearable and mobile technologies. Please hold your questions to the end and he will answer them all at that time. Just a reminder that this session is being recorded and is live streamed with viewers on YouTube. So keep your comments in local chat to a minimum. And at this time, I'd like to present to you, Mr. Franco Lodato. Hi. Hello, can you hear me right? Yes. Good afternoon, uh, and thank you very much, Speranza, for the introduction. Um, well, again, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about today about this project of Bay Bayou uh, that you described. And, um, you know, the topic that I will be covering is about the nature of design, which I believe is, uh, you know, connected with the idea of what this, um, ecosystem that we are discussing is all about. Uh, can you go to the first chart, please? It's up. Yes. So part, part of what I'm going to be describing is uh, this presentation is primarily about the meaning part of what and how these connections happen in nature and the capability that we have as a human to influence, uh, you know, by learning from nature and using nature principles, uh, the different aspects of, you know, everything that surrounds us. Um, the image here is just a simple representation of how nature has been, you know, a, mo a motif of influence for engineers uh, to try to replicate that now, you know, nowadays with robotics. So that's the trunk of an elephant 
and all the complexity that it described, you know, and then this uh, particular application for a robot. So we go to the next one. So three principles uh, are innate in nature that, um, you know, are intrinsic in our bodies, in ourselves. And one, the first one is about curiosity. So all of us um, are really in the capacity of being, you know, triggered since early ages about what really surrounds us, what we, what we can do and what is happening around us. And I think the ecosystem that we actually are talking about is based in, you know, different uh, areas with uh, water and, and different organisms. It's uh, an important part to actually put ourselves at that mindset. What is behind? What is what nature can offer us? How nature presents to us the different opportunities and solutions that, again, uh, they are really always in front of us, but we normally uh, lose of, of perspective. So we go to the next one. One of the important part of how nature uh, influences us is that there's always a language that translates to different things we do. So you can we also find nature opportunities to teach us about, for example, light structure or lightness as a concept. So in the left side of the chart, left top, you have a image of a diatom, and uh, uh, you know it's a microorganism that have the capability. You know, through those holes, that actually is the picture on below, to, to you know, uh, practically live from those uh, um, environments that it's around by using the water that's around it to feed. Uh, lightness actually can be seen in bubbles, so there's the picture in the right corner, or uh, even in the structure of, you know, composition of the uh, winds of a dragonfly. So line is an important concept, again, that is always present. And, um, you know, it's a very interesting part of what I believe uh, some of this uh, uh, aspect that important to learn how to apply from nature. So go to the next one. Another aspect of uh, and how nature present is really the marketing aspect, the, the proposition about how uh, you know, you perceive or the animals in this ecosystem perceive each other. Um, I can't see the chart if it's clear or not, but you know, you will have images of animals that live in this ecosystem. You know, uh, depending on the on the area or the habitat, you will have birds, you know, who actually require necessity uh, from one each other. You have, you know, frogs and you have other animals again that are interconnected and related what is important to understand is these systems actually rely on one each other and they present in their own way, you know, in this case, I use this as a marketing inspiration. You know, if you see the frogs, for example, in the forest in Costa Rica, they are miniature frogs. They look gorgeous. They have incredible vivid colors, but the message they tell you is, you know, they are dangerous. And for other animals in the forest, again, they understand this language. So in a way, uh, the messages that nature tells you are all interconnected. And again, the point I'm trying to do is that these are principles that already nature uh, itself uh, create and, and present constantly. Can you go to the next one, please? Same happened for uh, structures. Um, so most of the uh, structures that you normally see in, uh, in the environment are actually a compound of different ideas. So uh, you have the possibility, for example, of having plants that require to live from humidity. And these plants modify, morph, and change their structure by the presence of water. They do also that only in certain time of the day. Uh, at the same time, you know, the structure is, is so simple and, and so uh, tender that, you know, during the sunny days, plants actually don't turn themselves and then they can survive. So the correlation of that, the flexibility, if you want, as I put here in the concept, is uh, another learning very important. So uh, what I feel, again, is relevant is, again, this aspect of curiosity and this aspect of uh, understanding and observing is what actually gave us to the point of trying to interpret that. So if you go to the next one, uh, here is a, a chart from, you know, uh, the Atlantic Code from Leonardo da Vinci, where again, people like Leonardo, which I admire all my life, have been able to uh, condense and if you want, uh, integrate 
all of these learnings by observing, you know, in detail everything that happened. In this particular particular case, he actually, in order to design and to draw very realistic, uh, you know, paintings about the human body, he went up to the extreme to actually understand how the human body were by analyzing cadavers and, and dead people, you know, up to understanding connections with bones and muscles. So the observation that he actually used as a process was deep and many knowledge came out. We still use some of his learnings. Uh, but there are other products, if you go to the next one, that we probably have seen in the, the market, you know, that have been a product or sub-product of the observation in nature. Uh, one of them, again, is the Velcro. So Velcro is a, you know, a system of attachment inspired by nature. And um, the principle that this particular material uh, was inspired from was from the goose gas, you know, seeds. And so these seeds are actually uh, designed in a way, nature created this opportunity to have the plants being capable of being distributed in a very large area by uh, using those hooks. I mean, just for reference, the seeds of the goose grass are probably, you know, one millimeter, uh, one centimeter in diameter, so probably half an inch, and they have uh, about 250 hooks. So what the plant does is allow these very little seeds to being capable to actually attach to fur of animals and so on, and then spread around. That's how uh, the discoverer of this one, who was uh, George de Mastral in 1950, he was able to uncover this opportunity and put it in a place. And then if you go to the next one, you will see a cross section in a microscope of what this is. So uh, what I'm thinking here again are three or four uh, major ideas of how this concept in nature, these principles of observing, interpreting, and then applying for solutions can and are being used, you know, for us for eons, generations. Uh, but more importantly, how that can be actually used for specifically this program that we have and, and how can we interpret and learn from this ecosystem of, uh, you know, animals interactions for what we're going to do. So I have a few examples of projects that I've done. I'm going to please go to the next one. I condensed that in a methodology in a process that I crafted over the years, which I call biodesign. But pretty much uh, the intention, the idea here is that by taking from nature, most of these ideas and putting and understanding how they use that for from the form standpoint and from the process standpoint, implement that into, if you go to the right of the chart, that, uh, you know, lines there represent how the process of design implementing nature can go and uh, overlapping actually on the uh, standard process. Many products have been done that way. I mean, uh, it's interesting because after my analysis, if you see the, that graphic looks like a DNA, and actually that's one of the models I've been using for years in how to interact and intertwine all of the different sciences and elements that are related when you actually create something new. This process has been used, as I say, for many, many, many applications from either material products and of course, medicine. So if you go to the next one, uh, this is a sample of um, most, you know, short sample of the products I've done over the last 30 years. And what is relevant is that most of these products, which I'm gonna show a couple of them in the next few charts, are uh, primarily inspired and developed using a deeply analysis of nature. It goes from toothbrushes, uh, razors, uh, you know, airplanes, cell phones, medical products, and etc. So uh, the point is that these processes, this mindset, if you want, this methodology is definitely capable to open the doors, uh, uh, exercising some mind stretching again, to try to understand how nature simple uh, systems are actually working and how to move along. Uh, if you go to the next one, please. So in here, um, this is an example for a car uh, that was designed uh, for a brand called Maserati. This was on in actually 2004. And uh, at that time, the inspiration for what they wanted to resolve, which was, can we have a vehicle that can live in cities, totally connected, interconnected, uh, by simply 
actually working and driving around either with a person or not. This was a hypothesis in 2004. So they had so much tender that what do you know, during the exam sunny days, plant the charge and itself, and then they, they can survive. So the correlation of that, the flex certain depth, you know, three, four thousand meters, uh, by using sonars and other type of magnetic um, interconnection, but also they have sensors, you know, to identify food and each other's. So we use that uh, influence or that input not only to understand what to put in this car, and I will describe there's probably about 250 technologies that we put there at the time with Motorola uh, that uh, allow at the time even to connect the car with the outside, with yourself, your body, and also the city, but also using technologies at the time that were far beyond you know, what we know today. Uh, we were using at the time hydrogen fuel cells and drive-by wire. Um, this car actually was developed, if you go to the next one, up to a prototype level and is a working you know unit and it was inspiration for the Maserati brand for the other products you see in the market today the Gran Turismo and the Quattro Porto. So in, in this particular case showcasing uh, technologies was the scope but again these are complex systems that you know were presented and you know admired by people. So we go to the next one the same application of the process, but for something mundane, if you want, which is a tool, it's a knife that goes through your skin, calling a razor. And here the idea was, can we, using nature input, resolve the problem of how to actually self or help guide gliding a blade in the skin? And the answer is yes. So we use the example of the snake, the desert snake. Desert snakes are capable to live in environments up to 120 Fahrenheit degrees, and they do that by covering their body with an oil, which is UV protected. The way that works is when you go deeper to analyze their skin, their skin is compounded by soft and hard, and the internal soft part is a spongy and carry this liquid. Every time it moves, it's dispersed that outside. And so we actually use that to create in the, in the cartridge, this is the MAC3 for Gillette, the cartridge strip in the top, that mini, you know, little piece in the top, blue and white, is designed uh, using that and you know this is a, a product that probably many of you are using today so other example of how to use these in a more complex system if you go to the next one is a project i work in products i did for motorola uh, specifically submersibles and if you want they call it military spec product so these products require certain extreme uh, requirements and and you know uh, technologies you want to resist uh, being submerged and shock absorbing and so on. But more importantly, it was necessary at the time to identify materials that were uh, able to be uh, carried in the same moment, you know, a structure, uh, information and so on. So we went to analyze the exoskeleton of lobsters uh, and crustaceans. So a typical of this lobster, this is a, a, a stone lobster. And um, so understanding how that work and how the, the, the shell was actually built, we worked with a German company, BSF, to develop this material that was capable to offer not only the shock absorbent, but the resistant underwater and, and other benefit. And this product again was a very successful product in the United States. Um, going another example, which again, uh, uh, for me, is a very didactical one, but it's one of the most simple. You go to the next chart, please. We have the ice axe. I call this the woodpecker ice axe. And uh, simply speaking, you know, uh, the company required at the time, this, this design is timeless. This was only in 1980, the end of 1980, 89. Um, but the company was requiring to design a tool. Uh, they were you know, trying to resolve the problem of ice climbing. Very complex, uh, ice change density, you know, by the minute in sun or not sun, you know, and two, three degrees of uh, difference made the change. So we use the woodpecker as an example. Woodpeckers are capable to hit 25 hits per second against the wood, no headache. And they have also the capability to make holes, you know, just by moving and varying the angle of the bags. So this tool uh, was developed uh, and actually became a you know standard tool for climbers in the right you have one of the at the time expert uh, mountain climber 
Pierre Talvivel in the north uh, west. I'm sorry, west uh, northwest side of the Mont Blanc. Uh, as you can see, there is no rope. He was using the tools, and then he was a, a string a, a skis, and he's still alive. Uh, but he was a guy, you know, who used the tools to test. So we go to the last, uh, the next one. Sorry. So what I explain as an example here is that uh, nature as inspiration not only can give us the possibility if we use this process of observation uh, you know analysis and interpretation um, it gives us the possibility to re resolve problems in a sustainable way and also uh, in an appropriate and elegant way so it by itself and if you actually isolate these particular elements um, they don't have a value per se, but if you put them together, as we see in the Bayou and in this ecosystem, you have each one of them codependent on the other and analyzing them in, in his complexity can be something, you know, to help resolve problems in the future. So I close with the next one, please, with a quote from a American poet, a Rolf Frost, where, you know, what, what happened is as I say at the beginning of my presentation, we have seen these over and over since we were kids. You know, every time we go into the environment, we got in awe. And uh, we actually uh, learned to do this when we were little. Uh, we actually lost a little bit this over the time, but, you know, nature continuously tell us what to do and show us the way to get out. Problems so and this is, uh, the point, so, uh, the point is that this process Thank you, Franco. Um, does anybody in the audience have any questions? We do have a few from the um, YouTube audience. So anyone in the current audience here in front of us, do you have any questions for Franco? You can speak or put them in chat. Um, if not, um, the first question I have from the YouTube audience is, um, of the many things you've designed and developed, what is your favorite and why is it your favorite? Um, I think the last one that I always use in my presentation, which is the woodpecker, I feel at the time uh, the, the importance of understanding and being accurate in translating the the process and how nature resolve uh, simple things. It was something that I have the passion I still have and I do every day, but that product, that project was at heart because I remember it was a time where uh, I wanted to showcase and if you want to uh, share the, the intention. I remember during that time, I was still a young designer, recently graduated, and with my wife, we were always looking for how can we show that this work and this project was a moment uh, that was uh, highly represented. Uh, the product is still in, in, in sale with some modification I've done over the years and uh, it's in a permanent museum in uh, Copenhagen and exhibit. So it's at heart. And the reason again was because I have the possibility to do it at, at full extent. You know, every piece of that tool is designed with an impact or learning from nature, from the texture and the handle, copy from the shark skin, the backs of the of the, the, the end of the of the eyes axe inspired by the backs of birds, uh, the curvature of the bird. I mean, it was it was so so so, so beautiful. Sorry, um, Shiloh in the in the audience here is asking: Are solar designs being redesigned using nature as an inspiration? Solar cells. She just says solar designs. Sorry, uh, can you repeat the question? Um, Shiloh, says, would you like to ask your question fire. again? So we go to the next one. Solar oh, yeah. cells. Solar cells. Oh, solar cells. The same okay, application right of the process but for some are designed mundane. with nature inspired. That's what they say. 
Um, I see the question, but only say solar cells are, are, are solar designs being redesigned using nature as an inspiration. There so. are some, um, I mean, I, I, at the beginning, at the when, when they started with these signs, as far as I remember, uh, you know, this is probably 15 years ago um, when they start making more commercial. Yes, they were trying to use to mimic the silica, uh, you know, the value of how leaves of, of trees were working on. I, I think what, what is important to understand is that the 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 ratio, the scale in how to replicate certain things with technology are sometimes very complex. But yes, there was an intent before uh, the technology wasn't there. I think nowadays, you know, the Tesla cells, for example, are probably the most closer that you can do. Um, probably the design doesn't represent it, it's a square and so on, but there are other products that are more organic uh, in, in the way of how the capturing of the cells are, meaning more replicating uh, you know, round or, or hexagons, which is really the, the best shape. But the answer is that yes, there is an intent. The technology have been in, has not been catching up as should be for these implementations. And you ask also for the homes. I think on the homes, it's a big story there. There's a lot of uh, uh, architecture have used nature many times, you know, as an inspiration. But again, the limitation is the material, the technology. The next uh, day in Miami. The next domanda. C'è un italiano in linea. <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry. Yes. The next question from the um, YouTube audience. Ecology is the study of interrelationships. Everything is tied to everything else mm -hmm. in the ecosystem. Can you comment on how the relationships in nature could inspire something or design? Yes. Um, I mean, if, if you remember a little bit in the beginning of the chart, um, of, of my chart, the interrelation, so if you talk about anything, let's pick any organism, everything that represents or have a outcome in an organism in nature has a specific function and a value. So there is interconnection. There, there, there's no way this is going to be isolated. So nature doesn't build things that are separated or so on. Now, if he does the same principle for an individual, the, the same rules apply when you are many individuals, so like systems or ecosystems. So the correlation of integration exists, again, from the cell up to the individual or individual. So it's real. It's understanding how they interplay. That's the hard part. But once you start discovering those processes, if, you know, you then can apply that, you know, in a, in a more uh, larger scale to what, uh, you know, the applications can be. But yeah, there is a, there is a direct connection between, you know, those two elements. Um. Jay, did you have a question? Yeah, I had a question. Actually, I had a comment, then a question. Uh, when I came to this lecture, the first example that hit me was the Wright brothers. I went down to their museum uh, in North Carolina, and uh, they were, in the early 1900s, wrestling with the problem of controlled flight. You know, a lot of people were flying things around in balloons and so on. The objective was, how do you control a glider? And they looked at bird wing. Birds obviously figured out how to do it, uh, heavier than air. And what they found was that birds warped their wings. And so they first airplanes did wing warping. Uh, nowadays, of course, we call those flaps. You don't, <laughs> you don't warp the whole wing. But uh, to me, that's a classic example of engineering, uh, mirroring uh, birds. And uh, the other thing that I was thinking about as a paleontologist, um, and I've used this in my class many times. If you look at fossil cephalopods, which are squids in the past, they had shells, and they look remarkably like submarines. Uh, they function like submarines. They could control uh, the water to oxygen ratio inside the, the shells of them. So they could control the buoyancy. They control thrust by ejecting water from their mantles. I'm wondering, by studying fossil organisms, if we could come up with more sophisticated, better designed um, uh, submarines, for example. They even control the balance of the shell by putting more 
calcium carbonate at, at uh, the narrow end of the shell. So any thoughts about that? Yeah, it, so I, during my career, I've done different work. You know, I worked in DuPont in my early time of my career, designing materials. And um, what you are describing, you know, for the bonds and so on, it, it's so interesting because what happened, as you probably know, you're on paleontology. So the, the time frame of that you are describing, you know, for those animals to evolve to where they are, the moment we see is millions, okay, of years. And uh, we try to man-made or replicate those. So at the time I was in DuPont, we were trying to replicate lightness uh, using gas injection in polymers. And I remember they were modifying a polyester, you know, at the, at the, at the heart. And this polyester, uh, when you mold it, didn't give anything until there was a moment that we started injecting gas inside. And again, this is in early 90s. But the, the point is, uh, even even today, you know, I believe that uh, part of what is happening is trying to catch up. So the ideas are so compelled that, as I say, technology doesn't get us there. So what we're doing here right now, this particular virtual experience, you know, exists in the, in the world normally, you know, that's what you dream, that's how you do. So we are trying to use our tools that are limited to replicate that example. And I think that is the real, you know, challenge, you know, how, how to make it work, uh, the look as real or look as, you know, evolve as we want with the limitation of the tools of the trade that we have right now. Shiloh has uh, made a comment. I'm also thinking about electric cars and how nature designs have been incorporated and how electric yes. cars are being built. Um, there was a, a uh, when we did the, the bird cage in 2004, 